Highness, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, thank you for asking us to be here today. Um, my name is Alec McCaw and Charlie, Charlotte Thornacroft, um, and I will have a chat. Um, in the end of February 2022, as we all know, the war started in Europe's second largest country. Uh, it started relatively suddenly, certainly surprisingly for a lot of the people inside the country, it was very sudden. Um, Ukraine has an estimated equine population of some 225,000 horses and approximately 20,000 mules and donkeys. There was a significant and understandable panic uh, which led to appeal for help across all sectors. I mean, not just the equestrian sector, but obviously, but the whole wider um, society. And obviously, um, those of us in this room are gathered here to understand what happened in the equestrian sector. Um, within a couple of weeks of the war, Charlie, you, you were in Poland. Oh, hi. Why? Well, I think because I answered the phone to you. <laughs> um, but there was a press release which went out from the um, sort of British equestrian world, and I replied to it saying, if you need any help with the admin, then you know, I'm your person. So the next thing I knew, my phone was ringing, and it was Alec. Little did I expect that that was going to be the next seven months of my life um, in Poland. But we had various frenetic conversations with a huge number of people in the UK and across Europe and in Ukraine um, and decided that the only way to actually understand what was happening um, was for a person to go out to Poland and see what was happening on the ground. Um, we thought it would take me three days to work it out and write a report from which we could then all coordinate a, an effort. Um, it didn't take me three days, and <laughs> I was there for seven months living in Poland. Um, but we, it, it's still ongoing, we're still doing a lot, but um, that, was, that was the beginning. So at the beginning, um, so it was, uh, the, the phone call came and it was three days, I think you were on a, on a, on a, on a plane going into eastern um, Poland. Uh, in the meantime, it's a lesson to us all, really. You have to be very careful about to whom you answer the phone because if it pops up and you know the person on the phone, do you answer it because you're busy? Or do you leave it alone because the next one that phones you might be somebody telling you of the car crash that you've had yesterday that you didn't know you'd had, that you, have a, you can claim for your uh, injuries that you didn't know you yet didn't have. Um, I got a phone call from Alice Fox Pitt saying... Uh, that the Catastock Pony Club had done an amazing job in the first week of raising funds for uh, a lorry load of goods to go to Ukraine. And then actually when you, uh, and that she wanted me to help her, I think was how she phrased it. And that was the last time I spoke to her. Um, um, so we, we set about um, uh, using that same address book and unfortunately for people like Jamer and Roly Owers, their numbers are in my phone, um, and somehow, and it's, it's a f funny sort of memory, and I don't really understand when the chrono how, how the chronology worked, but we got in touch with Tatiana and Martin Kilo, who are these poor Estonian people who were website developers for the Ukrainian Federation and who still run the whole relief project, essentially, don't they? Yeah. I mean, they, they do. And before we knew it, they were sitting, we knew the inside, as Charles, <laughs> we knew the inside of their house pretty well and the entire wardrobe because we were on the video calls with them all of the time. But so you that was the problem, though, wasn't it? Was that there was this huge amount of people that were really interested in helping, and we were all based all around the world trying to do all sorts of different things, but there was no coordination. So actually it was Roly and Claire and Dave Rendell and you who actually, and Jim Eyre, who coordinated all of that. And Claire managed to send 14 lorries um, over very, very quickly, the same day that you spotted 13 trucks on Facebook that were destined for Poland. And you know there was this massive groundswell of people all over the world and we weren't responding quickly enough so actually it, lots of splinter groups then appeared which yeah, I made think that it more was, complicated. And that was the point wasn't it? We, we, the, the, the amazing people in this room because you know the Brits do do things like that very well the amazing people in this room came around and coordinated this enormous 
uh, relief project, really. Um, and we were, and, and the Brits still do remain one of the most key players in all of this. So let's talk about you anyway, it's about you. Um, you arrive in Western, Eastern, Eastern. even Poland. Yep. Um, so what was, what was there? What did you find? What did you do? <laughs> uh, well, I booked into a hotel which um, seemed, don't ever go for a spa hotel in Poland. It just means that you have your own bathroom. <laughs> That's it. Um, and it also, this one had two regiments of Polish soldiers who were getting ready to head off into Ukraine. So every morning before breakfast, there was a lot of firing into the car park, which was slightly alarming um, for somebody who is not military trained. And I think that is quite key, is that I'm neither military trained nor actually working in the equestrian industry. So why I was a person to send to Poland remains a big question. Um, know your friends. Well, you work, for the, you work for the Pony Club, so you're well, you're very well um, qualified. But um, I had a, a phone number and an address um, near Zhezhov, which is the main military airport, of a of another very good person who ran a competition yard, a show jumping competition yard, and had four tenths worth of temporary stables, which stayed up permanently, but they were only temporarily occupied. And she said that we could use two, so that meant that we had... Um, 60 stables um, and she said we could use two for a couple of weeks what she didn't expect either was that we'd still be using them six months later nor would she have expected that um, DHL would be appearing 24 hours a day with one bag of feed that Mrs Miggins from Spain had donated and been sent um, or that there would be, be these huge lorry convoys of lorries arriving with with everything and anything you could possibly imagine. So this, when I arrived, they, we had no running water because it was minus nine at night, so the pipes were frozen. Um, I had no records, no staff, horses arriving imminently, but no real information as to what the plan was or what was, what was needed. Um, so it was a, a bit of a baptism, baptism of fire. Um, and my first job was to reassure Eva that we would put some controls in and that her staff would not be called upon at all times of day and night to look after horses or unload lorries of stuff. So that was the initial moment. And, and describe the sort of the logistical challenges that you had. So um, you've alluded to the fact that, you know, we spotted, because of the, of the powers of social media, but Rhea and the panel before were talking about many people became aware, firstly, that Les Nivola existed, mm -hmm. and secondly, that maybe this was the destination. And before you knew it, you were channeling the 14 lorry loads that Claire had brilliantly got coming over. What were the, and, then, and then the Swedish people coming, or the Danish, or the, whoever. What were the, what were the logistical challenges that you faced? Well, again, it came down to communication, because there was this con an idea that actually all these horses were being set free in Ukraine, and that anybody with a trailer and a paddock could drive over to Poland and collect them in a sort of a bit of a New Forest style roundup. But that is actually not the case because um, the borders are still, as um, we've spoken about earlier today, uh, pretty difficult to cross. And um, we, had, we had some issues with, with the borders. Um, but I think the... Coordinating everything that arrived was difficult because um, with customs you have to have lorries of the same types of things going across the border. British lorries and, well, European lorries can't go across into Ukraine for a start. Um, so we had to unload everything and we didn't have a forklift. Um, it was just me unloading 40 tonne trucks by hand with, and I did, I did buy a pallet trolley but um, its wheels fell off very, very quickly. Um, and I couldn't find a forklift for love nor money. So we, that was how we unloaded it, um, which was a challenge. And although we were very grateful for everything that came across, it was trying to coordinate all of that, record it all, get it sent to the right places. Um, and all of that was a logistical challenge. And what other... Um sort of uh, political and social aspects. You, you were when you were there, you made it sound quite sort of simple in the sense that you were just unloading lorries, but I think we can 
expand a little bit on some of the social <laughs> and uh, political challenges? Well, language was a problem to start with. I don't speak Russian, Polish or Ukrainian, um, and those were the languages that we needed to deal in. Um, so it wasn't just the paperwork that was very arduous, it was also just communicating with people. Um, the Russians are also scrambling all phones, and um, there were. it was all right when I was co communicating with um, the Ukrainian Equestrian Federation, but if I was communicating directly with people further into the country who were desperately in need of their horses moving or themselves moving, um, and the Russians got hold of the fact that they were communicating with somebody who spoke English, they then didn't, they, some people did disappear. Um, and I don't want to know where they went, but I do know that bad things happened. Um, so I had to be very careful to use Google Translate at all times to communicate with anyone in Ukraine um, and write in Ukrainian. But then there was a difference of culture um, we look after our horses differently in the UK and when I was first out there it was minus nine at night and I had been sent several lorry loads of fantastically warm rugs so I would go around putting rugs on all the horses. If any of them had come over with owners they would be as quickly taking the rugs back off again as I was putting them on. So you know, we have just a different way of managing horse welfare. So that was an issue. Um, the fact that I was female was quite a significant issue. Um, the Ukrainians view women um, differently than we do, and so I was rescuing people from the border who, when they saw that there was a girl driving the car, wouldn't get in the car because girls don't drive. Uh, nor do they unload 40-ton trucks, nor do they um, do many of the things which I had to do as I was the only person there. So it was a case of, yes, my name is a male name, but I am female and you're just going to have to <laughs> accept that. <laughs> um, so that, that, but that was a, a problem. Um, we also, when the horses arrived, I had no idea what their history was, um, when they'd last been fed, how long they'd been in transit, um, the rules that we're now putting in place about how long an animal can be in transit without getting out of a lorry. I'm afraid I did not um, comply with any of those. Most of ours travelled for 72 hours without getting out of the lorry, and that I would consider a decent journey time. Um, and if we could get food, hay and water into the lorry, we were jolly lucky. But most of the time, we didn't, because if you stop, then you can get shot at, and most of the lorries I was using have got bullet marks on them. So it was a case of keep moving until the fuel runs out, um, and in the meantime, don't worry about what's happening behind you. If there are kicking and everything else going on, just keep driving. Um, so, you know, they arrived in sorry state, some of them. So you, you set Les Navoda up. That was the that was the place uh, that was the farm just on the east coast, uh, a border of, of Poland and Ukraine. Um, the you then set up a logistics compound right on the border. Yes. Uh, where so the, the lorry stopped coming to Les Navoda in the end, which was this competition yard, and it's they started coming to this logistics compound that you drove up and down 100 kilometres a day to unload the lorries by hand. Uh, with your yep. broken trolley. Um, <laughs> so you've you explained a little bit about the horses coming back. Um, the, the, the no, none of the European boxes, horse boxes or trailers, were allowed to go back into Ukraine, isn't that correct? No. So the, how were the horses coming back? What was, what was the mechanism for extracting horses? So we had three horse boxes, um, all of which could tow a trailer, and I had five drivers, which had three of which had been sourced by the Ukrainian Equestrian Federation, um, and two of which I subsequently found, um, one of whom was a vet, a uh, hero vet, as he quickly became known. Um, and they, they would, would either respond to pleas for help on social media, which actually there was a huge team of people um, in England who were following social media and then sending me WhatsApp messages saying, have you seen these people or whatever. Um, we'd, I'd communicate with them via WhatsApp. People had my number um, and my phone still rings relentlessly so that there are still people needing help. But the, the drivers would 
decide where they could go and try and collect as many horses as possible at the same time. We took the partitions out of the lorries and you can fit more in, really don't listen. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we filled the lorries with as many horses as we could. Most of them had owners, but we had to take them to a temporary stables that was funded by the FEI um, in Lviv, where we would check them for microchips. If they didn't have them, Weatherby's very kindly sent me a thousand microchips, um, which we then put in them, and then started the paperwork that you'd normally need to get horses across the border. Um, I have spent many hours over the last year lobbying DEFRA, um, Ireland, Rowley, anybody else, uh, any show jumpers who I used to work with to try and work out how on earth anyone is managing to get horses from a non-EU to an EU country. Um, ben from Bramham's got so fed up of me asking him questions and he thought that you know I was obviously very, very blonde. So he flew out to Poland because I'd got 17 horses on the first load that were stuck and could I get them to Germany? Could I hell? Um, so he flew out to say, right, this is how you do the paperwork. Um, four days later, he had to fly home for his wife's birthday, and he had not managed to do the paperwork either. So um, that just goes to show how long it took to get anything done. Um, but I was lucky to have such a network of experts who could uh, you know, spend time doing things. Um, so that, that was a big problem. The message just said time to wind up, but we haven't even got the good bits yet. Um, oh, we hurry so, up. <laughs> so by conclusion then, so just um, very, very quickly, just th th that was the sort of the difficult bit, and we haven't gone through some of the awful things that you saw in the, the really dark days. We haven't, unfortunately, managed to have time to talk about th those, which we were going to, but we're, we're, what's happened, sort of summer came along, what, what happened sort of May time onwards and then we've had another winter and you've still very very much involved what um is still consuming great parts of your life what or all of your life what, what's happening <laughs> well i think the um groundswell sort of slowed down although um we are still managing to get a lot of things across we've got food and um medicines going over vet medicines from beaver going over although there was one very quick story i can tell you about the first set. So poor Dave Rendell um, used to get WhatsApps from me all day and all night, so I apologise to his family. Um, I am not a vet, and every horse that came over seemed to come over with something. So I'd send him a WhatsApp with a picture saying, please help. But I was also um, getting a lot of WhatsApps from people in Ukraine saying we need this drug and that drug and whatever else. So I had to send them to Dave to say, is this a Father Christmas list or are these real things that we need to get across? Um, and one of the stories which Hero Vet told me was that there were a lot of horses which had catastrophic injuries, which um, he was not able to put down humanely. So he asked that I get um, the drugs to, to do that so that he could. Um, because horses were being put down not using bullets because um, they were needed in the war effort, not using humane ways. And there were plenty of stories where horses with catastrophic injuries which were not able to travel were clubbed to death or hit or slashed to death um, in a way to, to end their lives very quickly. So Dave kindly sent me um, a lot of ketamine-based drugs. Unbeknownst to us, ketamine is very, very illegal in Poland and Ukraine. So I now have a warehouse full of ketamine, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I may or may not have driven in my car to the border, having identified some vets who were happy to use that rather than club these creatures to death. Um, and then we would do handovers uh, on the border, on the border really, uh, and we would hand over ketamine and hope that the border guards did not stop us at that moment. So it's fair to say you, 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 you were a social worker, we haven't done that bit yet. 
because you did an um, awful lot for the people as well, I think. It's, it's, we have to conclude, but we, you did an awful lot for the people that came across. And you well, saw every some, horse has a family, doesn't it? And every it? horse has a family. And some of the people that came across were very traumatised, and some of them not... All of them. All of them, but and also physically not in a very good state as well, some of them. And they had nothing with them. I mean, horsey people seem to travel with things for their horses and not for themselves. So if they had managed to escape with anything other than their precious horse, it was only for them. So they arrived, many of whom had been sleeping rough for several weeks. Um, I had one couple of twins who told me that they were 21, but they were probably as close to 21 as I am. Um, and they arrived with their thoroughbred mare, which they wanted to turn into a dressage horse. They'd been working their way from the Donbass. It took them three and a half months to get to me. Being twins, it was very obvious that what one was meant to look like, her entire face had been completely rearranged. Um, and when I suggested on their first night that they might want to come and stay in the hostel, have a shower, a hot meal, and um, I could get them a change of clothes, they decided that that was absolutely not something that they wanted to do. And when I did my late night checks of the horses, I found them curled up in the stable. I tried to persuade them to move, but they said that they had been um, working for some soldiers. I don't know whether they were Russian or Ukrainian. They'd been acting as sort of cook and cleaner and caretaker. And when food had run out, the soldiers had suggested that, as a joke, that they would have burgers for supper that night. It quite clearly was not a joke. And so the one girl had defended her horse and had her face rearranged as a consequence. So by the time she got to me, she looked a mess and we've had to arrange for her to have plastic surgery and all sorts of other things since then. But, you know, these people are making decisions and living through circumstances that even Steven Spielberg can't imagine. Um, and that, that is the reality that they are facing every single day. I think it just, um, the, the 20 minutes or so can't do justice to what Charlie did when she was out there or the experiences that she saw, but it also doesn't do justice to the uh, enormous community, um, you know, Claire and Rowley and Jim and Winnie who did all the comms and, and, and the Dave Rendell and the, the, the enormous community that came together, very British based community that we were involved with, that coordinated Certainly, the the biggest uh, aspect of relief from the from the world, and Charlie went out onto the front line and delivered what we were able to sit and discuss on Zoom calls and In via emails. And you delivered it with a small team of international people, Martin and uh, Tatiana Kilo, who are the Estonians, and and a little bit Mikhailo. So I just think it just it really can't, you really can't get a full understanding of, of, of some of the things that we know happened. Um, and I just think that uh, it, you were just incredibly brave to go out there and, and, and manage in a completely alien situation, alien to everybody, but, but you managed in a foreign country as a woman. So, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.